Welcome back to the shop and someone asked an awesome question which is off the back of my compression videos So the guy says to me right all right, so atoms don't touch So you have The, in the core of an atom the nucleus these are protons and neutrons and then around here in a fuzzy mess you have your electron shells. Not that close, but pfft, who cares? So the electrons are just just there ish. <laughs> this is all to do with um oh bloody hell fire. Uh quantum mechanics. Basically you can know its position but you can't know its speed and you can know its speed but you can't know its position, blah 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 blah. The uncertainty principle, that's what I was getting at. Basically um, I'm actually quite surprised that people struggle with this. It's like, um, you know, atoms are a fuzzy mess. Even the nucleus of an atom is a fuzzy mess. I'm trying to find my bit of uh, board rubbing jobby. You know, people expect to see a nucleus and this orbit, this perfect orbit like this. And... No, the fact of the matter is it's not like that, and it's weird that people seem to expect there to be like an, an atomic shell, like a shell is a ball, uh, like an atom is a ball, you know, people expect it to be like this sphere of stuff. Now, they're not like that because, let's just say it was, let's just say an atom had a shell. Well, we know from shells, or a football, or something like that, you have to have tiles that are three-dimensional in, you know, surface their surface it can't you know it can't be flat or whatever and if you had that then your shell would have to be made out of something well this is the <laughs> this is the stuff that your eggshell or your football or your tennis ball or ping pong ball this is the stuff that that's made out of it can't have a surface because then you'd say what's the surface made from and it's like well the surface is made out of loads of little balls and what are they made out of if they've got a surface? You have to get down to a scale where stuff just stops being component parts to a degree. So the fact that these like the brick is made out of grains and you have to keep on going down until you get to this yeah, fuzziness. So he was saying, back to that massive tangent going off on one. Um, so he was saying basically, you said that atoms don't touch. So if atoms don't touch, where does friction come from? Where does the heat from friction come from? You know, if atoms aren't rubbing together, and I get two things, you know, and rub them together, heat will be generated. Everyone's had a carpet burn, they know what it's like. So, where does this come from? Well, the surface of, a, the surface of anything, even the smoothest mirror ever made, is like this, right? And why is it like that? Well, when you look at it under a microscope, it's flat. When you look at it under a better microscope, it's flat. <laughs> when you look even, you go electron microscopes and stuff like that, you start to see stuff like this. On the atomic level, it is basically just piling up balls, right, like this. And this surface is fucking all over the shop. Um, so what happens is, is when you, um, there's a thing called ringing. So if you get two very, very, very flat pieces of glass, or you get, um, oh, what's it called now? Uh, just two pieces of steel, very highly pre uh, precise ground and lap steel. You can do a thing called ringing them together, which is in a sense called cold welding. And basically what you do is you ring them together so all the air gets pushed out, because there'll be air between these two surfaces. You ring them together, and then eventually they'll stick and you won't be able to get them apart. So that's basically what you do is you ring them and then you're trying to get rid of all that gas, just like with lubricants and all the rest of it. Now, what will happen eventually is just say this is our rough surface and this is our other rough surface, like so. What will happen is, is you'll have these bits where if we try and force this one this way and this one this way, like so, you can see that these sections intersect each other 
like so. So if we apply enough force to these, so this way, or load, that's a better word for it, we apply enough load this way, and obviously this is sat on a work surface or something, but there's an a, a opposite reaction, so this is a reactive force. Like so, it's kind of pushing back because it doesn't like to be compressed. When we rub these two things together, this is like when your crankshaft runs out of oil. <laughs> um, these these bits, they don't physically collide. Basically, they're in the way of each other. So what happens is, is this will break off, this will break off, this will break off, this will break off, this will break off. And that's how you basically end up with debris. That's how you end up wearing particles in your oil, stuff like that. This is, in a sense, is bedding in stuff. This is what bedding stuff in, in is. Now, the problem is, is that if you continue to apply this force, so let me just rub out all these centre sections. If we continue to apply force, this will fall down even further, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, until basically these surfaces are really, really smooth. This is how we lap something, this is how we grind something, yada, yada, yada. And the way ringing works, or um, cold... Um, cold welding or something like that is that you have these two flat surfaces that are really close together and the atoms inside are almost close enough or there are parts that are close enough where these atoms here just start like the other atoms next to them start sharing electrons and this is why we call it cold welding because it's <laughs> these two materials are close enough for this for these electrostatic forces to take hold right so great but if we try and shift this and we do apply apply enough force going this way then what happens is is those bonds break because they're not as strong as these ones let me just do a better diagram The range in a sense so all these atoms have like a fictitious force field around them like this and this is their range of influence basically and if they cross over they start sharing electrons and everyone's fucking happy when you have an oil in this system the same thing is happening there are oil atoms but they're in molecules but there are atoms like this Like this, and because obviously it's a liquid, they're a lot further so spaced apart. But again, they still have this interaction, this coupling, like this. And maybe that one shares with another one, and this one shares with another one, this one shares with that one, kind of thing. But because it's a liquid, is oil. These are a lot further spaced apart, like this. And the same thing kind of happens when you rub that. That oil has to move, and when you do that, because you're putting work in, that's where the energy is coming from, you are sliding one surface against another. All these um, electrostatic bonds, they will resist that, so you have to, some of your energy that you put into work is used in breaking those uh, bonds. And when you do that, you put work in, so we're trying to shift all these, that requires energy, and now these are moving, these bonds, these require energy to break them. Now it's not physically like Karate Kid where he's chopping bits of wood with his bare hands or out stupid like that. <laughs> but these require energy because these are now in a lower state. How to explain that is a different video. Basically everything in the universe is lazy. Atoms are lazy, they just want, oh, just relax and go to a lower state. Shit out a photon, I don't care about photons. And then they just relax. So this is a lower energy state to be paired up. And in a sense, it's like the burden of money. <laughs> it is when you're on your own, you have to pay for everything. When you have a partner, you can basically share that. You share the same toilet, you share this. That's a lower monetary state. It's a lower energy state. And atoms try and do the same thing. This is why they cool. They get rid of this excess energy. That's thermal energy. And um, they basically relax. This is all to do with entropy. Yeah, we don't want to go down that road just yet. But you have to break 
these bonds that are forming. With, that, with everything to do with energy and all the rest of it, there is a time component here. Like I was saying about compressing that cylinder, that fire piston. If you do it really slowly, if you've got a fire piston like this, and you have your little o-ring in your fire piston or what have you like that, if you apply a force here, but your acceleration is low, lower, no, low, dickhead, God's sake. If your acceleration is low, then you're putting work in, but your work is over time. So what happens is, is as you start to compress this gas, this gas will start to heat up because you are transferring your momentum from this mass to the mass in the actual cylinders, la di da di da But then these atoms will leach out, they will leak out these photons, it will heat up. So, like I said, you could do it slow enough. It depends about the resolution of your measuring equipment. If you've got severely accurate and it has a ridiculous resolution, you, you can record all this. But if you've just got a thermocouple or something, a thermometer basically, if you've got a thermometer, a digital one or something, you can compress it slow enough that you will never see a temperature rise. That's because it's not that it's not happening, it's just that the, the um, thermal out equals the work in so you're in equilibrium in a sense but you're not it's just this is all to do with the resolution of your measuring equipment but yeah the heat from friction the more force you put onto something to clamp things together and then push um, the more heat you will get it's like with sandpaper you get a sandpaper and just on a block and just push it lightly you're not going to basically tear much up because you're not putting that much work in and the heat generated isn't that much. You start really pushing like this, you're putting a lot of work into it and then there is more waste heat. It's all back down to thermodynamics. Whenever you do work, there will be waste heat. There will be heat that's leached away because you are basically just putting too much into the system. And even when you have a little block of sandpaper and put a time out of pressure there, the waste heat is proportional to how much work you put in basically it depends on the efficiency of the system it's not directly proportional it depends on the efficiency of the system a more efficient system will have less waste heat a less efficient system will have more waste heat stuff like that hope that makes sense and i'll see you in a bit and before i go this is where oil viscosity comes into things which we're going to be going through very soon hope that makes sense see you in a bit